myself in conjunction with the Nutrition and Health Conference. I'm Tara LeMay from Lens, and I'm going to be curating this afternoon's discussion. Uh, our format is always very conversational. I'll be introducing our panelists, Dr. Weil and Debu Langa. To, they'll provide some opening remarks, and then we'll delve into the issues for a few hours. We're going to approach the problem from two perspectives. One is the very high arc of the story. What's happening from a systems perspective? What are the big issues going on that we're looking at globally, and how is it affecting food? And then we're really going to look at how can we personally do something about it so that we don't leave as depressed as we might be by reading the headlines. Um, we have a number of questions already from the audience, for those of you who registered online. And we also have some microphones here that is, if time allows, we're going to be having some questions from all of you. So let me introduce our panelists. Dr. Andrew Weil, I'm sure you all know, is a world-renowned leader and pioneer in the field of integrative medicine. Dr. Weil combines solid medical education with a lifetime of practicing natural and preventive health care. As many of you know, Dr. Weil is a best-selling author of eight books, including Spontaneous Healing, Healthy Aging, and Eight Weeks to Optimum Health, and is a frequent guest on Larry King Live, Oprah, PBS, and others. In 1994, Dr. Weil founded the program in integrative medicine at the College of Medicine at the University of Arizona, where he is still the director as well as a clinical professor of medicine and a professor of public health, and he's the ho they are the host for this uh, event. David Lenga is also a doctor, and he's the director of the Food and Health Program at the Minneapolis-based Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. David applies a systems approach to the intersection of public health, agriculture, food, and the environment. His expertise includes the impact of food contamination and the means of food production on human health, including the impacts on obesity, ecological health impacts from the inappropriate use of antibiotics and arsenic in livestock and poultry. He's authored Playing Chicken, Avoiding Arsenic in Your Meat, Poultry on Antibiotics, Hazards to Human Health, and, and Putting Children First, Making Pesticides Level in Food Safer for Infants and Children. Clearly, those topics are going to come up today, uh, scary as they are. And uh, with that, I'm going to open the conversation to Andy for uh, giving us some of the color about what we're going to talk about, and then we're just going to dig into the issues. Uh, thank you, Tara. I'd like to welcome you first on behalf of the now the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. We have just become a center of excellence at the University of Arizona. And part of our mission is to train a new generation of physicians and other health professionals uh, in all the areas of lifestyle and influences on health that we consider important that are now omitted from conventional medical education. And one of those glaring omissions is nutrition, um, still. Uh, we are working to remedy that, and this annual conference is one means of doing so. If we were holding this public forum 3,000 years ago, the main issue of, uh, about food safety that we would be concerned with would be where was it coming from. Uh, that human populations throughout history have mostly had to deal with famine, uh, scarcity, death by starvation. That is not our problem. Uh, in fact, in America today, our big problem is that we have too much food and too much food production. And that creates a, a great many problems for, with, for us, not least of which is the obesity epidemic that we're seeing and the high incidence of chronic diseases associated with obesity and with the intake of the kind of food that we've become used to eating. If we were holding this public forum 100 years ago, uh, about the time that the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed for the first time, uh, I think the major issues that we would have been concerned about were the transmission of infectious diseases through food, uh, as well as concern about toxic additives uh, being used by food processors, uh, things like unhealthy dyes, uh, preservatives, for example. Now, it's interesting to think about how that's changed. I would say over the past 100 years, there has been a steady um, decline of concern about transmission of infectious disease through our food until recently. And it's interesting to see that now become a matter of concern again. And I think a lot of that has to do with the uh, nature of food production and distribution today. And this is something that David Wallinga will talk to us about. 
Um, associated with that is also concerns about safety of drinking water as a vector for transmission of infectious disease. Again, something that we thought had been settled long ago and now is not looking so settled in various parts of the country from time to time. I think the, um, a huge issue on people's minds today is still toxic contaminants and additives to food, but now from all sorts of different sources, uh, again having a lot to do with the ways that food is produced globally and distributed globally. Um, and this includes both um, deliberately added substances, again this is an area that uh, David will talk to us about, um, it also uh, has to do with all the concerns we have about eating fish today. Um, we just uh, ordered some lunch in the room and uh, one of the dishes sent up was uh, a grilled ahi, uh, some grilled ahi slices on salad and I pointed out that our card that we're giving people in this conference says we shouldn't be eating ahi because of mercury content. And then the question is how many times can you eat it a month? And why do we even have to be thinking about this and worrying about this? Uh, I think another issue that comes up related to this is that how paranoid do we want to be about our food? I know food is supposed to be, food and eating are supposed to be enjoyable. Uh, do we have to think about every dish in front of us in terms about whether it's harmful rather than whether it's enjoyable? And then a, a whole other area that I would like to get into if time allows are larger concerns about food safety that don't have to do with toxicity or risk of infection, but have to do with undermining of long-term health. That is, is the, is the nature of much of the food that we're eating today uh, responsible for uh, increasing our long-term risks of chronic disease? And that, that may have to do with ingredients in, especially in processed, refined, and manufactured food that we don't think of as toxic ingredients, um, such as flour, for example, uh, or sugar. So those are other issues that I hope we get a chance to talk about. So I'm going to open this up by saying, as we got ready for this um, discussion, I started digging into the research on it. And all of us read the headlines, and the headlines are pretty scary. And I thought, well, this is just the media being overly concerned. Um, this is the media making a bigger story out of it. But as I started to dig in on the issues, I realized that there were um, very concerning issues underlining the headlines and that and this is one of those cases where perhaps they weren't blown out of proportion. Perhaps we're having um, some issues that are coming from very different places we don't think about. Uh, just a couple of facts to start us out. The CDC reports that uh, each year in the U.S. there are about 76 million food-related illnesses and about 5,000 deaths. Uh, this is more people dying every year from food issues than from 9-11. The headlines have also told us about 600 people have been getting hep A from green onions in Mexico. That the toxins in our pet food that killed so many hundreds of pets ended up in our food supply through chickens uh, who were eating this pet food. That our, the toothpaste coming in from China was filled with antifreeze. Uh, salmonella and cantaloupe from Costa Rica affected 6,000 cartons of produce coming through the system. On February 9th, the New York Times reported that uh, the caterer working for the U.S. Olympic Committee went to the supermarket in China and encountered a piece of chicken, half a breast that measured 14 inches, enough to feed a family of eight, is what he said. And he said they went and had it tested, and it was so full of steroids that they couldn't have given it to the athletes because they would have all tested positive. So. Boy, that made you think. And then it goes on. It's not just international. There are plenty of U.S. cases that we've been looking at of E. coli and beef and spinach. The New York Times also recently reported that uh, the bluefin sushi served at upscale New York City restaurants exceeded the Food and Drug Administration's uh, action level. I'm levels laughing here, Tara, because my significant other, Kathy, and I were in New York the, the day before that article appeared, and we ate at bluefin tuna at one of the restaurants that was tested. And imagine how we felt the next morning when on the front page of the New York Times, this restaurant is named and the bluefin tuna that we ate is mentioned as a particularly rich source of mercury. Well, you know, that's the perfect lead-in because if, if, 
you know, this morning, after reading all this and, and sort of sitting the last few days, really getting ready for this discussion, this morning at breakfast, I looked at the menu and said, what the heck can I eat? You know, what's okay? And if you can't figure it out the day before, then I'm not sure how I'm going to. So the question I have um, for, for both of you to start is sort of how do we put this into perspective? I mean, what, you know, I thought the headlines were overblown, and it turns out I don't think they are. And I know, David, you looked at a lot of these issues. Maybe you can give us some, some thoughts to kick off the conversation. Yeah, well, you know, as Andy was speaking about the history over the last three millennia, I think one of my reactions was that the, the more things change, the more they stay the same, because many of those things are recurring themes, uh, whether it's um, bugs on food, bacteria on food, or, or contaminants. But, but the nature of, of the problems, even when they look the same in the face, the nature is changing. And part of it, the reason it's changing is, is how, is the really dramatic changes in how we're producing food. So for example, um, you know, foodborne illness has, has always been an issue. Uh, and salmonella uh, poisoning has always been one of the leading causes of food poisoning. What's different now is that much of the salmonella is resistant to multiple antibiotics. And that's directly traceable by the CDC and others back to the fact that we routinely put antibiotics into animal feeds for the chickens uh, that we're raising. And, and um, there's really a fair amount of consensus now among the scientists and the experts worldwide that this practice, um, which isn't for, done for any health reason at all, it's done to make the chickens grow faster and also to, um, to keep them from getting sicker because they're being raised in these very confined, crowded uh, indoor barns, which is not how we raised chickens three millennia ago. Um, but, but the result is that more of our meat, uh, and our chicken in particular, has these strains of salmonella that are resistant to multiple drugs. So that's just one example. Um, so, so those issues are different. The other thing that's different, though, at a personal level, is that 60 years ago even, um, I would say probably most of the American population was growing food in some way. They had a personal relationship with food. They had a garden. Um, maybe they had in-laws who were on a farm somewhere. Uh, so they, they recognized farm animals, which a lot of kids today don't. Uh, and and they, they understood that food had a context, that it comes from somewhere. That, that in part how your food looks is a reflection of how you grow it and how it tastes is a reflection of how you grow it. And I think one of the reasons for the reaction today from all the headlines that we're seeing is that people don't have that context um, for how the food is being produced and so it's, it's really confusing and often overwhelming. Andy, do you have a perspective on how to look at the headlines? How do you look at them? Uh, that's tough. I mean, I think if you read all the headlines, you can scare yourself to death and end up not eating anything. And also, um, I, I just as an exercise have looked through um, both popular and scientific literature on food um, and have concluded that you could come up with very clever, rational sounding arguments against every category of food you can mention. So if that were all true, there'd be nothing to eat. So we have to make compromises here. And I think um, it, is, it is important to prioritize these dangers and think about what, you know, what are the real dangers that you face and how to avoid them. Um, I think, you know, looking back on my own, I can only remember once in my life having food poisoning uh, from, from a restaurant in Tucson. Um, you know, when I spent a lot of time in, uh, in underdeveloped countries and, you know, I had traveler's diarrhea uh, and I once got a, a parasite disease in Ecuador. But, you know, up here I, I have not gotten sick from food. So I think your chances of getting an infection from food are probably relatively low. I mean, I don't know whether they're in the order of being struck by lightning, uh, which is a little higher here in southern Arizona than elsewhere. But, um, you know, I think that's, it's important to pick the things to worry about that are real. But just as an example, I remember once, this is a long time ago, having dinner 
um, in a home of some wealthy people who had built a house literally on the San Andreas Fault. This was about um, 30 miles south of San Francisco in the peninsula in the mountains. The fault ran through the house. And the, the woman of the house had a morbid fear of being struck by lightning, which is... <laughs> doesn't happen in the Bay Area very often. I mean, there is something much more real to be worried about there. Um, so I think it's important to pick your, pick your fears appropriately. So <laughs> I live in San Francisco. We don't have lightning. <laughs> and so, um, so I think it goes back to the question maybe where you started, which is what is unhealthy about what we're eating? I know um, a lot of the articles, as I read them, started to remind me of the conversations we've had at past public forums about eating local and eating organic. And is that really the direction that we go to to try to provide something to do, you know, personally to do while the system's being sorted out? Well, I'd like to hear what David has to say about the toxic contaminant issues, because that certainly is a big one. I mean, how do we avoid the kinds of things that might be in food coming from China, steroids, antibiotic mm -hmm. residues, whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I think uh, a good place to start is the issue with organic and, and with pesticides in particular, because there we actually have some pretty good data. Uh, what, one of my mantras is, uh, is don't just buy the food, buy the system of the food. And really what what the organic label is telling us is that something about how the food is grown. Uh, it, it doesn't, the certified organic, which is USDA certified now, doesn't allow synthetic pesticides to be used. Um, well, what's the impact of that if you actually change your diet? There's a team of researchers in Washington State that have been looking at that for several years. And what they've done on a couple of occasions is to go recruit uh, groups of children and put them on a conventional uh, diet of produce where pesticides are used and then switch them to an organic diet and monitor their urine for traces of a particular class of nasty pesticides called organophosphates. And what they show very clearly is that almost immediately um, uh, when you switch to an organic diet for a week, your urine no longer carries residues of that class of pesticides. And then when you resume a conventional produce diet, those pesticide residues come back. So this is kind of a, actually a hopeful thing to me, that here's something very simple you can do uh, that has an immediate effect, at least in terms of the residues in your body. Um, whole other set of issues about what the ultimate impact of that's gonna be on your health but at least you have some peace of mind in knowing that you're reducing your exposure. But with regard to that question, it seems to me it's very reasonable to assume that all of these chemicals can't be good for us. I mean, nobody exactly. is arguing for their health benefits. So therefore, the only question is how bad they are. Right. And uh, I think it's, you know, it's reasonable to assume that some of them are pretty bad, especially if we're taking great numbers of different ones into our bodies from different sources. Right. I mean, these are poisons after all. Well, that, one, one critical thing is, is who's eating the foods with the pesticides. The EPA has about 900 registered pesticides. About 140 are known uh, brain toxins, neurotoxins. So those organophosphates I mentioned are one of the nastiest classes of those. So those, that's a good one to avoid, but when it's particularly important to avoid is, is uh, when you're really little or you're pregnant and you're carrying a, a little person inside of you. And we actually have some good evidence that those exposures early in life do, do affect brain development. Um, uh, so that's a good place to start. What about arsenic, since that's something you... Well, ar arsenic's another interesting case. Um, one of the major stories about these food safety uh, uh, issues is that, unfortunately, um, our public health agency, the FDA, which is supposed to monitor the food supply for some of these things, isn't doing a very good job. And arsenic's a good case. It's, it's been approved for use in the U.S., as a growth promoter for chicken since 1946, okay? It's never been approved in Europe as safe, so they don't use it there, and it's not used in organic production. Uh, similarly, it's not allowed. So we've been using it since 1946. It's, it's a particular kind of arsenic. It's, it's an organic arsenic. Um, it doesn't have the same meaning. 
Doesn't have the it same doesn't meaning. Doesn't have the same meaning. It's organic just means there's carbon atoms attached to the to the heavy metal. But but some people have said, well, you know, that makes it safe. Well, it, it doesn't as it turns out. So anyway, um, a couple of years ago, uh, I went out by myself and I decided to test uh, about 200 packages of chicken that I bought in the grocery store for arsenic. Um, it had never been done before. Uh, FDA hadn't done it. And, and lo and behold, what I found is that conventionally raised chicken, about three quarters of the packages had detectable arsenic. And of the premium brands, the organic brands or the other kind of higher end uh, uh, sustainably produced brands, only about a third had detectable arsenic. So here, here's an example again where there is something you can do. Um, yeah, we can get our chickens from Europe. <laughs> no, the, the premium brands had, lo in general, lower levels. I, I don't want to overstate the conclusion because all I did was a snapshot in time, but it suggests that one way to avoid more arsenic exposure is to stop putting it in chicken feed because it's totally unnecessary. So, um, we're, in bringing up the issue of inspection in general, I think one of the things that I found in sort of uh, hunting down the research is that the food inspection in the U.S. has dropped 81 percent in the last 30 years when uh, the environments that our food has come from have grown many more times than that in the last 30 years. One of the questions is, is inspection part of the solution to the problem or are we overplaying that hand and really we have to get further back in the ecosystem and really rethink uh, the entire farming infrastructure and where the food's coming from? Well, I, I really think it's both. I think in the short term, um, many of us are going to be buying at least some food items that are uh, imported from somewhere. And, and I don't want to say that the inspection issues are just about imported food either. They're, the inspection budgets have been shortchanged for both domestic production as well as imports. But, but um, that's what's driving a lot of concern for people. So yes, I think in the short term, and Tommy Thompson said this as well, uh, that we need to drastically increase uh, inspection of the food supply uh, for safety. Um, the problem though is that uh, right now, a lot of the inspection system is in the hands of the companies whose meat is being inspected. So for example, the uh, the slaughterhouses that are inspected get to choose which meat samples get inspected. <laughs> and then if there is a problem found and there's an, a recall issued, you know, we just had uh, in the last six months the biggest recall of beef in the nation's history, 143 million pounds. Um, part of that went to 100,000 school facilities in 36 different states. So they issued a recall the recall applied to meat coming out of that single plant dating back two years, okay? So of course a lot of that meat had already been consumed. Uh, and then it's up to the company to go find the meat that's been unsold and to recall it. So there are some real weaknesses in terms of the inspection system. The, the bigger upstream issue I think is more important for the long term because ultimately if you're buying the food from a source that's closer to home, it's just sort of inherently easier to verify how it's been produced. Um, I have another question related to that. Michael Pollan, the author of The Omnivore's Dilemma, professor of journalism at Berkeley and a, and a very outspoken um, speaker on, on the subject of food today, and he has been a uh, speaker, participant in this conference in past years, uh, argues that the centralization of food production and distribution uh, so that there are fewer and fewer larger and larger producers of, of food that go to more and more people uh, leaves us very vulnerable as a nation. Uh, that if an infectious agent gets into lettuce uh, or if a toxic contaminant gets into a, a source of animal food, there's a much greater chance that huge numbers of people will be affected rather than this being just a local cluster. He also says this leaves us much more vulnerable to a terrorist attack on our food system. Uh, how do you feel about those issues? Well, I think both of those are true. Um, uh, 
this plant that had the huge recall in Chino, um, it, it, well, I think the size of the recall speaks to the fact that the industry of beef slaughtering and processing has gotten incredibly concentrated in the hands of very few entities. Uh, if we were talking a year ago, uh, four companies uh, processed about 84% of the beef in the country. But last month, a Brazilian company who is number three said they wanted to buy the number four and number five. So now it's going to be more concentrated if that goes through. We're going to have three companies controlling over 90% of the beef processing. And so every time one of these rounds of consolidation happens, we end up with fewer slaughterhouses slaughtering more cows and, and therefore proving your point that if there is a contamination issue, uh, it's going to affect a much broader range of the meat supply. And, and by the way, going back to the issue of 3,000 years ago, um, another worrisome thing is that if you look at agricultural uh, products, we have become, human beings have become dependent on fewer and fewer species and varieties. Uh, that is, for example, almost all the potatoes produced are now of one, one or two kinds. That the genetic diversity of food crops has been enormously reduced. Uh, and that this leaves us very vulnerable there as well. That if mm -hmm. some plant pathogen uh, attacks one of our major food crops, we could be done in. Um, there's, there, there, we don't have the variety and all of the um, unique genetic uh, constitutions of plants that people had not that long ago. So David, you mentioned that the middle is, is going away in food production, that we're seeing a very high end with consolidation and a very low end in uh, local purveyors. What's happening to that middle? Where's it going? And how do we try to inspire more diversity that way? Well, well um, let me back up for a second and just say that I think it's worth pointing out what's driving the consolidation that we see in the biggest companies. It's not, it's not being consolidated for health reasons, it's, it's pure economics. So what has happened is that the biggest companies uh, are, are basically grabbing more market share across a range of industries, whether it's corn processing or beef processing or pork processing or, or uh, chicken processing. And so uh, a lot of that is driven, too, by the fact that much of our farm economy in the U.S. is around these commodity grains like corn and soybeans. And most of those are being fed to these animals. So the end result has been this consolidation up and down the food chain from the grains through the meat and the meat processing. Um, that's, that's happening at sort of a very grand scale. And the largest farms that are producing those commodity grains are, the, are those that are growing the fastest in number. These are farms of more than 1,000 acres. The other kind of farm that's increasing is the really, really teeny farm. These are farms under 100 acres that are supplying farmers markets, which have just skyrocketed, that are feeding the CSAs that a lot of us belong to, uh, and direct, uh, directly supplying people with food. And that's, that's a great development. But what it's leaving out are the farms in the middle. And this is what Fred Kirschenman, who's a farmer philosopher in Iowa, um, calls the ag in the middle, agriculture in the middle. These are farms between 100 acres and 1,000 acres. And by and large, there's still families who live on these farms that have been in their family often for generations. And the problem is twofold. Those farms in the middle are disappearing. There's not really a place for them in this, in this food system we've created. They're too small to compete with the really big companies, and they're too big to, to rely on farmers markets and CSAs. And so in the supply chain of the food economy, there's not a home for them. And I think um, what we don't have yet, but which would be a good thing to have, would be schools and hospitals and government cafeterias and corporate cafeterias contracting with those medium-sized farms to supply a value-added product. In other words, a product that's healthier or produced in some way that's deemed uh, uh, more beneficial.